rolling. <laughs> Next, you know, we're going to be rolling down the windows and answering the telephone. All right, good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, October the 14th, 2021, and this is your Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. I am Deborah Kafour, your county chair, and Commissioner Lori Stegman is excused today. The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In accordance with the declaration of emergency announced on March 11th of 2020 and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on June 24th, 2021, today's meeting is being held virtually. To align with social distancing guidelines, some rules associated with Board of County Commissioner meetings will be temporarily altered. Please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking. And when you present, make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. May I please have a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. The board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Uh, I'm not seeing Commissioner Myron yet. Uh, Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The consent calendar is approved. Opportunity for public comment on non agenda matters. This is the time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you. I will set a timer for three minutes. When you begin speaking and announce, um, when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up by saying time, at which point, please wrap up your sentence. When you are done with your sentence, I will place you back on mute. Uh, Madam Chair, we received um, four, sorry, five submissions for public testimony and uh, one written uh, public testimony, which was shared with board and staff. Um, our first testimony is from Beatrix Bliss. Um, let me pull up the attendee list here. And Beatrix, I'm going to unmute you. You can begin now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Beatrix and I'm a member of the Oregon Sex Workers Committee. We have a problem and we need your help to fix it. Our problem is the law enforcement stings being performed in Mono Multnomah County. I understand there's funding available from the feds for carrying out these sting operations framed as a way to end human sex trafficking. But if you take a closer look, it's obvious that human sex trafficking is just another name for prostitution. This is what you're being paid to do in the practice of prostitution. Now conflated with human trafficking, and that was the goal to inflate the two, conflate the two. But prostitution is a derogatory term for what is now called sex work. Prostitution is actually something every one of us is guilty of selling ourselves in exchange for money to live on. The only difference is what part of our body is being sold. The commissioners sell you commissioners sell your brains and knowledge of management and problem solving. Others sell their backs and arms making our roadways. There are workplace risks for each job, and we can be harmed by these risks. Being a county commissioner can be extremely stressful because of the enormity of the responsibility. Construction workers can be permanently injured by an accident. But you don't have to worry that law enforcement officers are going to hunt you down, arrest and handcuff you and take you to jail. This is a workplace hazard sex workers face every day. And it's not just professional providers I'm referring to. Sex work is the last resort for many Oregon residents who are down and out. For those who have no one to turn to, sex work is a safety net that provides a means of support in hard times. Are there exploitive situations? Absolutely. But there are in most, almost all workplaces. I'm looking to, into the number of residents in Multnomah County who have been arrested for sex work related crimes from 2005 through 2020. There are a total of 989 people. They're not 989 undesirable people. They are 989 hardworking tax paying people like you who have had their lives upended for nothing more than an arrangement to have consensual sex with compensation. Had they done the same thing for free, it would be legal. The impact the arrest has in the lives of these 989 Minolta County residents is far reaching and lasts the rest of their life. Assuming they can post bail and they don't lose their job, often they do. 
Every time they have a background check done, these charges will appear and they will suffer the stigma of being connected to prostitution. People lose jobs, job offers, and housing for no other reason than that. The list goes on. Just as importantly is the cost to the county's budget. Getting a few dollars to hunt down and arrest sex workers and their customers takes time away from police investigating crimes reported by residents who've been injured in some way. Every hour used to hunt us is an hour not spent resolving the issues people in this county have reported to you in hope of attaining some resolution. That is it. Only the beginning of the cost you incur when residents are arrested for misdemeanor charge of having sex. There's an impact to the district court system, which is already operating beyond its capacity, and the ripples go out to many other public organizations. Is this the best way to spend limited resources? Are we the criminals who need to be found arrest and arrested? Are we low hanging fruit? That's why we need your help to stop the stings and help us to live productive lives that contribute to a better community instead of one that spends tax dollars farming consensual adults for having sex in the privacy of their own home. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Marina? I'm sorry, I was having a conversation with myself. Um, <laughs> our next, <laughs> our next presenter, you were kind. <laughs> our next speaker is uh, Peter uh, Tessere. Uh, Peter, you're unmuted and you can begin now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you regarding the status of police sting operations to combat human trafficking. I'm Peter Tessereri, a registered nurse licensed in Arizona, Oregon, New York, and Washington. I serve as an ally to the Portland area community of sex workers and adult entertainers. It fits in with my nursing practice. Nurses advocate for groups, educate the larger community on health issues, and use critical thinking and non judgmental points of view to achieve improved health outcomes. Earlier this year, the Portland Police Bureau publicized numerous arrests made in their sting operation, which they claim serves to combat human trafficking. However, they arrested clients who responded to online ads that solicited sexual encounters with other adults. Official police statistics indicate that for the year ending 8-31-2021, prostitution arrests amounted to 0.6% of total arrests reported by the four county police agencies. And out of a combined total of 61 prostitution and kidnapping arrests for the first six months of 2021, just 18% were from kidnapping which may or may not have involved human trafficking. Nurses use this type of investigation and reasoning to make decisions on how to proceed with care activities. Nurses apply this to groups as well as to individuals. My learning tells me that S workers have been pushed aside and left behind when it comes to full participation in society. As evidenced by many studies and surveys, their ability to interact with clients in mutually agreeable, consensual and contractual activities is impeded and stopped by such actions, such as police things and street sweeps. Additionally, misguided federal law impedes online work, which further prevents sex workers from participation in our free enterprise system. Sting operations prevent sex workers to become full participants in the community. They serve to reinforce dated ideas and stereotypes. Sex workers and adult entertainers have health needs, care for their children and other family members do grocery shopping and even go to the auto mechanic. Sting operations cause harm to people, forcing them to work in the shadows and exposing them to abuse, coercion, and physical and mental harm. Please take the first step to end these sting operations and work with the s worker organizations towards becoming full participants in community life. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, just our next speaker is uh, Kate Mar uh, Mar Marquez. Kate, I'm gonna unmute you. Okay. There Good. you begin. Thank you. You can hear me? Yep. Yes. Good. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Kate Marquez. I am a member of Oregon Sex Workers. I strongly oppose Multnomah County's use of prostitution decoy stings. Encouraging the commission of crimes is simply an opposition to the police's core objective. Do the Multnomah County commissioners believe that their constituents support decoy stings? In fact, a large majority of voters support the decriminalization of sex work. 
most people don't want public resources used for such a dubious, historically corrupt and corrupting use of police resources. My interest in the issue is personal. 40 years ago, I returned to school after leaving a marriage I could not return to. To support myself and my eight year old daughter, I went to work at a massage parlor where I worked alongside mostly immigrant women in very similar circumstances to those recently murdered in Atlanta. They were the mothers who were the support of their immediate families and often of their families back home in their origin. What is the solution? The ACLU and most human rights groups support the decriminalization of adult consensual sex work. If adult consensual sex work were decriminalized in Oregon, we would look at sex work with a labor lens rather than with a criminal justice lens. Sex work would still be subject to zoning regulations and, and administrative law, as all businesses are. Oregon may want eventually to use a process of inclusive community collaboration to develop policies for sex worker businesses to operate safely and with goodwill in urban spaces and with neighbor and in neighborhoods. Thank you for this opportunity to speak, commissioners. Thank you for coming this morning. Our next speaker is uh, Bella uh, Michelle. One second. Bella, you are unmuted. You can begin. Hello, commissioners. My name is Bella. I'm a single mom, a small business owner, and a sex worker. I'm here to request the immediate defunding of prostitution stings in Multnomah County. I come from an unstable home. I was orphaned at a young age bounced back and forth from relatives and left on my own the moment I turned 18. I just wanted to live and I found myself in a situation needing money fast to obtain food and housing. Unsure of how to go about that, I was introduced to sex work. Fast forward a decade later, I go to work, pay my bills, provide for my kids. I'm in a position of being able to provide security for my children. I don't need a roommate. Life is stable, life is good. I'm building my photography brand, which is funded from sex work. I'm the most secure I've been since the whirlwind of losing my mother so young. Sure, there have been bumps along the way, like the time I was arrested in a human trafficking operation and charged with prostitution. I had to compensate the nanny for overtime while I was being processed and waiting to post, to post bond. Attorney retainers, court fines, plus the extra time spent commuting back and forth to court hearings. It's a brief description, but let me be clear, being arrested for prostitution nearly ruined my life and put me on the brink of losing everything. I feel victimized and taken advantage of by the justice system. My criminal record is public. My mugshot and charges were broadcasted to the general public through various media sources. I was not offered any assistance or social services, but I was questioned as a mother denied a number of jobs and denied housing because of my accumulated prostitution charges. Clients that solicit me are not the problem. My consent to solicit for funds is not the problem. Using taxpayers' money to fund decoy stings that throw people in jail and label them criminals is the problem. It leads to job and housing loss. It tears families apart. Decoy stings between consenting adults is the problem. I found myself between a rock and a hard place after being arrested in a decoy sting. It was already a challenge working around my kids' schedules. To be charged with prostitution made me a poor employee candidate in the eyes of most employers because of the negative stigma that comes with prostitution. I made a decision not to become another statistic. With limited options, I used the skills and funds I accumulated through sex work to start a photography business. I owe everything I am and everything I have to sex work. I'm very proud and grateful for that. However, in the blink of an eye, I can lose everything if I walk into a decoy sting and I'm arrested for prostitution. Sex workers want rights. Giving us our rights would ensure our safety and protection from predators. Many of us are parents, academics, business owners, advocates. Stop dehumanizing prostitutes and allow us our livelihood. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Our, um, our last speaker is Ashley P. Ashley, I'm going to unmute you just one second. Okay, Ashley, you can begin. Oh, 
Sorry, Ashley, um, you can begin. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Ashley Pelton. I'm a licensed master social worker, and I'm here on behalf of the National Association of Social Workers, Oregon Chapter, as an ally to the Oregon Sex Workers Committee to advocate for the defunding of prostitution-related decoy stings by um, Portland Police Bureau and Multnomah County. The criminalization of sex work has created both seen and unseen harms to our communities which have had unintended consequences, as well as have had uh, generational impacts to the families of sex workers and the families of their consensual client base. For instance, conviction records create challenges that trickle to every part of a person's life, such as barriers to accessing housing, education, and employment opportunities. When our loved ones, friends, neighbors, and community members are barred from fully participating in our communities, we all lose out. In addition to community service obstacles, inherent societal bias and discrimination is reinforced when law enforcement supports the criminalization of sex work by utilizing decoy stings. This harmful discrimination and implicit bias perpetuates an unsafe work and living environment for sex workers and clients, as well as places these individuals in situations with law enforcement where they are seen as a community problem. Criminalizing a consensual act between two adults creates further stigmatization and creates uh, the work and um, drives the work into the shadows where sex work is less safe. One of the purposes of decoy scenes, things is to reduce the number of people seeking sex services. When clients fear criminal charges and don't seek services, the demand and value for those services go down. This means sex workers will have to work more for less and will have to work in less safe environments just to meet their basic needs. The relationship between sex workers and law enforcement is already fractured. If a dangerous situation occurs, for many, calling the police does not feel like a safe option. Removing the target from sex workers makes it safer for them to report abuse when it does occur, and we are all safer as a result. As social workers, we believe that the solution is to bring sex work out of the shadows so that we can protect our community members to the best of our ability. The NASW urges, us, urges the commissioners to support the defunding of prostitution-related decoy stings by PPB and Multnomah County. These resources are better spent toward issues that impact public safety rather than further disadvantaged folks who engage in consensual sex work. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to um, acknowledge that my staff um, are meeting with members of the uh, Oregon Sex Work Association organization today. And I know that several of the commissioners staffs are meeting with them as well. So thank you for your time this morning. All right, Marina. R1, Informational Board Briefing on COVID-19 Pandemic. Jessica Guernsey, Jennifer Vines, Dr. Jennifer Vines, good morning, dynamic duo. Good morning, Chair Kapori. Uh, for the record, my name is Jessica Guernsey. I use she or her pronouns up the presentation. <clears throat> So we're in front of you today again to bring uh, an update on um, COVID-19 today. We're going to focus um, on our data or routine uh, data updates. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the vaccination progress we've made and also the planning pivot we're doing right now um, in relation to the um, hopefully soon to be approved uh, pediatric vaccinations. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, foreshadowing some of the schools work and potential pivots, um, depending on what we see with the progression of the disease. And I'm not sure if, oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Marina. There we go. There we go. So next two slides. And I can turn it over to Dr. Vines. Great, thanks, Jessica. Good morning, Chair Kapoor. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Dr. Jennifer Vines. I'm your Multnomah County Health Officer. I'm going to show you slides that I always get to show you, but I think it's really good for some perspective. Um, so this is just our case count curve uh, for the calendar year 2021, starting on your left-hand side in January. Um, you see the big swell fueled by the Delta variant there um, as you make your way uh, all the way to the right to the most recent wave of cases. Um, you might see that where we are now after a steady decline is actually just finally below our peak uh, of our next uh, highest wave, which was last winter in January. So while it does feel like we're on the other side of the Delta variant wave, uh, we still have a ways to go because the peak was just so high. 
Um, again, these cases are all comers. So these will include vaccine breakthrough cases, which are now between 20 and 25% of all cases, according to Oregon Health Authority analysis. And that's, uh, that's running very consistently with what we're seeing around information about uh, vaccine effectiveness against infection uh, and just the changing proportions as, as more people get vaccinated, uh, more cases are vaccine breakthrough by definition because of the, the weighting of those numbers. I will just point out the orange and blue lines uh, that uh, show uh, white versus black indigenous and people of color as categories. The gray line is um, unknown or uh, someone declined to respond. Uh, we start to see daylight um, between uh, white and BIPOC community members there as we look at the Delta wave on the right. Um, but uh, as you drill down into those specific uh, communities, they are still uh, overrepresented among um, cases and hospitalizations uh, according to their share of the population. Uh, next slide, please, if you would, Marina. Um, so this is test percent positivity. Uh, some people have heard that I, I kind of like this metric because it's a pretty good barometer for how we're doing. Um, so you've heard me say that less than 5% means we're doing pretty well. 5 to 10%, we need to be paying very close attention. And over 10%, uh, we're in uh, a dangerous area. Um, the, the, this um, particular metric takes into account the volume of testing. So those are those blue bars. Again, looking at calendar year 2021, the burgundy bars at the very bottom are the total number of tests positive. Uh, the blue uh, bars are the total number of tests done. And so this gives you a relative look at how much disease transmission you have uh, in the community. And so you see us there, we got um, into the uh, uh, danger zone um, uh, over the course of the Delta wave in Multnomah County into the uh, six and seven percents. We're headed back towards 5%, which is great news. Um, and we're tracking pretty much with Washington County there, uh, Clackamas a little bit higher than us still at about 6.8%, statewide even higher at 7.8%, with some counties uh, still in the 20% range um, on this particular metric. Um, so this does um, lend itself to problems. If, if testing volume goes down, that will make your percent positive higher. If testing volume goes up, it will make it seem lower. Um, but in general, it's a fairly good uh, marker for where we are. And so you can see us starting to come down to um, a place where we might uh, exhale a bit, although it's still, still pretty bumpy, pretty high plateau. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our Multnomah County hospitalizations, again, by week. So you're looking at calendar year 2021 again, same, same time, timeline. Um, you uh, see the wave of hospitalizations fueled by the Delta variant wave that we had heading into late summer and early fall. Um, if you take your eyes to the yellow band and you scan over time, you see it swell in the spring. Um, this was reason for alarm. This is uh, Black, uh, African-American, African immigrant and refugee hospitalizations. So there's been a lot of work around messaging uh, for vaccination and other really on the ground work um, to get the word out about vaccine and do some really hands-on, uh, frankly, repair um, with, this, uh, with this community, uh, just given, given the history of public health and medicine and its treatment of the Black African-American community. Um, and so you see it sort of swell again with the Delta variant. So we still clearly have work to do. Um, if you look at the blue bar, you see um, that uh, showing up in the most recent Delta surge. That is American Indian or Alaska Native. Uh, we do have our Future Generations Collaborative uh, working intensively with this community and, and has been for a long time. Um, but again, I would um, see that as another marker of um, historical both neglect and abuse, frankly. Um, from medicine and public health. And so uh, repair work and ongoing work uh, happening there. Um, the good news before I leave this slide and turn it back over to Jessica is that when we look by age group, not, not represented here, but when we look at the pediatric population, we see a bit of a bump um, because of the Delta surge, um, but not terrible. And so our pediatric hospitals thankfully have continued to have capacity, they've continued to function. And while we did see a bump in younger people hospitalized uh, over the last several weeks, um, it was relatively uh, low compared to other points in um, the pandemic. And so um, that is a bit of good news since we really were in a moment of uh, intense uncertainty, sending our kids back to school uh, at probably the worst possible moment in the pandemic, um, but uh, really a relief uh, to know that we're on the other side and that uh, our kids overall are doing fairly well from just a purely um, uh, 
uh, health infectious disease standpoint. So I think I'm happy to pause for questions, but I think this is where I um, turn it over to Jessica to share more with you about our vaccination efforts. Uh, let's go on Jessica and then we can have questions at the end. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> And next slide, I'll we'll talk a little bit about our vaccine numbers. Um, again, you all are quite used to seeing these um, slides at this point. So this gives our total number of um, vaccinations across the county <clears throat> when you combine um, uh, two doses and first dose, um, we're close to 600,000 in terms of um, the number of folks uh, vaccinated in Multnomah County. So we're continuing to increase those um, doses uh, day by day, and I would be remiss if I did not call out and thank our tremendous team um, administering vaccine, doing all the work um, to plan and manage all the different clinics, both at our standing sites and um, our pop up sites. So, thank you everyone who continues to work day in day out on this next slide, please. And then this is just the whole count um, looking at. Uh, rarest race, race, ethnicity, and age groups. Um, and in looking in our Multnomah County numbers for- Sorry, um, I know I, that you all put these slides together maybe a little younger than I am. So if somebody, uh, Marina, could you, uh, what's it called? Make the font bigger here. Thank you, much better. It, if it makes you feel any better, I couldn't actually see the numbers myself. I had to write them down before the presentation to read them off, so it's not you. Um, uh, so, these are our whole numbers for um, race, ethnicity, and age groups and percentage wise when we look at um, how we're doing across the county. And again, this is over all vaccination sites, not just public health or the vaccines that we administer. We um, have about 99% of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander um, population vaccinated, 69% of um, Asian communities. 75% of white community, 61% of black African American, African immigrant, 57% of Latin, Latinx, and 64% of American Indian, Native American. So those are what our percentages look like overall um, for the county. They continue to come up, particularly in the areas where we have gaps, where we've had our um, equity uh, focus and our vaccination efforts, um, and they're continuing to move up, which is, is good news. Next slide, please. Jessica, your audio is super scratchy. You sound a little robotic this morning. I don't know if there's a way mm. to fix it or not, um, but just- as I a can turn off my video to see if that helps. It's probably the internet connection. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, why don't you try that? Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, but it doesn't sound better. All right, I am not sure what to do. I'll try to speak a little louder. Is that better? <laughs> I, it's fine, but you can turn your okay. camera back on since, since we can, uh, it's not making a difference. Sorry, um, my county computer might be on its last leg here. Um, so just to review the whole numbers um, for our public health vaccination uh, clinics, we've received um, about 158,000 total of all three vaccinations. 132,000 thereabouts have been redistributed to reach high risk um, individuals through partner agencies. Um, we've held um, over 300 clinics, 138, 138 of which have been um, with a focus on BIPOC communities. And we are still hovering around 70% of all of the public health clinic vaccinations being distributed and given to um, BIPOC individuals, which again has been our focus. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about our pivot in planning. Um, as I'm sure you all have heard in the news, um, both boosters and um, uh, pediatric vaccinations are in the headlines pretty much every day. Um, so at this point, um, we are uh, doing pre-planning um, for the, in particular, the pediatric vaccinations for ages five to 11. Um, if all goes as well, we expect there to be the emergency um, <clears throat> use authorization approved by the end of this month, which in theory could mean that we would have um, vaccine on the ground for pediatric vaccinations as early as early to mid-November. 
Um, obviously, there's wiggle room in there given all the different levels of approval that need to happen, but we're actively planning for that. Um, the way that we're approaching this is um, we are pivoting our culturally specific community engagement and education um, to really create a longer um, and more intensive on ramp, especially for um, communities and parents. Um, that have quite a few questions about um, what this means for younger children, which is not a surprise. This is a very different um, approach than adult vaccines. We've already done some um, community engagement and outreach and planning with our community partnership and reach programs to assess um, what the questions are and what we need to stand up ourselves and also in partnership um, in particular with um, HealthShare and healthcare providers, specifically pediatric providers to make sure parents are getting um, questions answered before they make a decision. We are anticipating um, a continued need for um, what we describe as low barrier community focused um, pediatric vaccination sites with a parallel continued focus on um, closing the equity gaps for teens and adults. Um, so probably the biggest part of this that's going to look different is that we are we are going to need to um, shift some of our some of our vaccination space arrangements in the way we're delivering vaccines for children five to eleven because um, obviously when you're you're vaccinating younger children um, you don't want to have a room full of um, young children that are seeing others you know crying um, and potentially scaring folks um, as they're getting the vaccine so we really need to look at a different um, facilities footprint for um, pivoting to pediatric vaccinations and we're doing that um, right now. And then we are expecting a very robust presence, um, obviously, from uh, the health systems and the large pediatric practice um, in the um, Multnomah County area. So we're co-planning alongside OHA, um, healthcare, CCOs, and CBOs to ensure that we have um, multiple venues for um, young folks to get vaccinated. Next slide. So would you like me to stop? Chair Pagori, do you want me to go on to the school's update? Um, what, why don't you stop for a second and we'll take some questions. Um, Commissioner Myron, do you have any questions on what's to date? Did she fall off the call? All right, Commissioner Jayapal, do you have any questions on what we've heard so far? Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Jessica and Dr. Vines. Just just one question. I, I, um, so it's about the connection between vaccine rates and shelter capacity. I'm wondering whether there's some sort of, is there a threshold vaccination rate that allows us to go back to pre-COVID shelter capacity? Or is that sort of a, or are there other guidelines that determine that? I, I'll take a stab at this um, question, Commissioner. It's a really good one. We're actually literally grappling with it right now, like today. <laughs> I think your I think your thinking is on the right track. Um, it's partly vaccination rates. It's also partly using some of the uh, disease transmission metrics that we have to figure out what is the overall risk of introduction of the virus. So as things like cases comes down and the percent positive comes down, then the risk of introducing the virus to any setting becomes much lower. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what, what is that threshold where we would be reassured about allowing more people into shelter, also knowing that the risk is gonna tip. It's, it's gonna become more dangerous to be outside in the cold than it is to be inside worrying about COVID. Um, so we've explored things like uh, vaccine status tracking in shelters. It's, it's really uh, not something that has a lot of traction because of this particular population, but we are looking for other ways to figure out when do we think that balance tips towards having more people indoors? And then how do we wrap around that to make sure that we are tracking cases, that we're managing any outbreaks that happen, and we're making sure that those shelter providers really feel supported and like and public health is there with them uh, as we figure it out. Jessica, did I miss anything? Nope. Nope. Thank you. That, that's really helpful and I uh, completely appreciate how complicated it is. Um, and you, you hit on why the question came up is where the, the weather's changing. Um, and so I guess a, a follow up, do we have any sense of what vaccination rates are like in our houseless population? 
I, I believe we do have the sounds. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can get that information today. Um, I can talk to Mark Joel and I think we had a, I believe they have some general sense. That'd be great. Thank you. Commissioner Vicki Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to share that I always keep the like a PDF version of the slides on my other monitor so I can zoom it into 200% so I can actually read the numbers. That's like my little cheat during these meetings because um, I can't see the screen on this one. Um, but I, I do have a couple questions. So one, um, are, are we worried about or tracking the, uh, the data at all about um, people who are not um, following through with their vaccine series and are not completing the series? Is that, a, is that a concern? I haven't heard much about it, but I was just thinking about it when, when you know, you always yeah. have a series in progress. And I'm just wondering how many of those series in project progress might be people who have, aren't going to be completing the series. Um, I can definitely pull the number. It has not been a concern. Um, early on, we definitely were watching that, um, but for Oregon in general, it has not been a particular challenge. Our numbers were well below national rates, but I'd be happy to look again. It is on the state website. The last time I looked, um, it was not a particular concern. Okay, that's great. That's really good to hear. I appreciate that. Um, and then the other question I have is on the on the slide, um, the one that actually was zoomed up the, about the race and ethnicity in and I haven't dug into the site in a while. Do we also have not just the number of um, people vaccinated per race and ethnicity, but do we have the like percentage of people then in that those population that have been um, vaccinated in, on the site? Yeah, that's the, those were the percentages that I read and I'd be happy okay. to put that in an email to you. Okay. Um, we, yes, we do. Okay, but is it on the site just so I can go? No, it, it's a different. It's a different. It's a different slide on the um, Oregon website. But we can definitely send you a link and include it next time. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, those are my questions. Thanks so much. Thank you. And did Commissioner Myron come back on? All right. Well, keep going. Okay, hopefully I don't sound too much like a robot at this point. You do. Um, it's pretty bad. I would just encourage, um, we'll get through this morning, but I would encourage you to do, to maybe try, I don't know, talk to the experts, but. Um, I will. I think. Okay. Um, the slides went away. Can we go back to the school slides? Just one second. Sorry about that. That's okay. So hopefully this slide um, looks uh, familiar, just to remind folks of the school notification process that we have in place, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we uh, have um, a system set up that's closely linked, obviously, with the school districts and Multnomah Education Service District and our CD team. Um, parents uh, notify the school or providers um, that reports a case to the health department. Um, we work very closely with the school districts, MESD, and uh, like I said, our communicable disease team to confirm cases were on site if they were infectious. Um, and then the MESD nurses work with schools to identify exposed individuals, cohorts, and activities, and that's what informs um, the uh, uh, decision to ask um, either students or staff and teachers to quarantine for a period of time. Um, school letters are sent to individuals um, that are exposed and to the school community. Um, and then we do the investigation of the outbreaks and advise schools and districts along with MESD on any changes that need to be made. Um, and obviously it goes without saying this is a tremendous amount of work for the size of our jurisdiction. So again, just want to thank all of our partners that are involved in this effort. Next slide, please. And I'm not, I don't want to jinx it, but I'm just going to say your audio is suddenly better. Oh, good. <clears throat> um, so for school exposures, the last time we were in front of you is the first time we brought some numbers to you based on what we're seeing. You know, we're still relatively early in the school year um, at this point, but in September, we saw about 265 exposures for all Multnomah County K through 12 schools. Um, we're not through with October yet. So through October 11th, we had 173, which obviously indicates a climb, which is not unexpected. 
Um, I'm going to remain on the positive side and say that I believe that the, the incredible work that has gone above and beyond state guidelines has paid off. I know it has been a tremendous amount of work, but I think we're seeing generally an expected, um, you know, we're going to see cases. It's not, we're not going to not see cases, but we're seeing a relatively low number of cases. We have 69 um, schools with multiple cases and only 22 with evidence of transmission associated with school with a school activity. So this is the dimension that we look at really carefully because obviously young people are involved in other things outside of school. So our um, CD team and MESD and the schools when they're looking at what's actually happening, that's actually what helps us determine what level of transmission is actually happening at the school. And I always say that you know, for all the work that the schools have done, I believe they're one of the safest places to be because they really are um, implementing um, all of the prevention activities um, to ensure that folks are staying safe. Next slide, please. So a little bit about what we can anticipate, like I said, it's still early in the school year. Um, we're continuing to look at our data very, very closely. We're also working obviously really closely with the state and our regional partners in Clackamas and Washington County to compare outbreak data to make sure there are no outliers and that we're looking at this regionally. Um, but right now we're beginning to look at how are we going to evaluate our current approach, especially with the impact of um, student and staff quarantines. Um, we expect to be doing that in early November once we have another full month of data. And depending on what we see, um, we um, may recommend a modified approach um, to quarantine. Um, we, we surely want to mitigate um, impact to um, in school in classroom time, but we obviously need to balance that with the careful um, health risks and protecting folks health. Um, in addition to that, we will be talking to some schools about exploring um, testing pilots to better understand the potential for in classroom spread. Um, there are multiple levels of school testing going on. This would be really specific to understand a little bit better what's going on to help inform any changes that we might recommend and work with the state and our regional partners on. So that'll be coming up um, in late October, early November. Next slide. And I believe that's it for our formal presentation. Thank you. Jessica Guernsey and Dr. Vines, um, appreciate all of your work. All right, commissioners, um, questions or comments? We'll start uh, this time with uh, Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, thank you so much for that. I've been, um, you know, obviously like really um, interested in how uh, the return to school is of impacting kids. And it seems like it's going really well. Um, there have been a couple of cases in my kids' school, but they've been fairly isolated. Um, and but I and I did appreciate the the fact that we're going to be looking at like what the quarantine you know standards are for kids to try to keep them into school. Um, Jessica, you had mentioned briefly that um, that like our our criteria is kind of even above the states. Could you talk a little bit more about that? About how what we're doing is is different and and you know probably better than what the state had recommended. Sure, um, we worked with the school districts um, to really focus on areas and, and Dr. Vines, please jump in as well. Um, focus on areas that we saw as, as potential, what I'm generally gonna call loophole areas. So those are um, areas like lunchtime, um, sports, um, other sort of non-academic um, activities like choir or um, drama, uh, and really looked at, um, are there additional prevention um, efforts that folks could take Understanding that there are just extreme constraints in terms of space and access to supplies um, to help folks um, really plan a little bit deeper on reducing um, transmission in, in instances that we know from last spring contributed to transmission. So one example would be lunchtime. Um, when we had a nicer weather, um, we worked with the schools to do our best to um, help them creatively consider outdoor space um, for lunchtime use or even hallways and other classrooms. Um, obviously, that's a time when um, youth are taking off mass speed. Um, so really going above and beyond uh, what the state recommended to help folks get creative to reduce that risk. Uh, Dr. Vines, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add. No, thanks, Jessica. No, I, that's it in a nutshell. It was just looking at where, uh, where were the areas we could just really, really tighten up with distancing, masking, uh, getting, getting high-risk activities outdoors, 
Um, and to credit our schools in the county, they, they listened. Um, and I really think that's helped put us where we are today. So thank you. Great, thank you so much for um, sharing that information. And as I'm telling my kids, like eating lunch in the rain builds character like that. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for, for all of your stuff. And, and, and I'm not surprised and so, and so glad that Multnomah County has gone above and beyond to really protect the safety of our kids and keep them in school. So thank you. Commissioner Dreibel. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jessica, for this information. It really is good to hear that you know, cautiously optimistic about the level of risk for kids and being kids in school being low, um, because it's it's kind of struck me from the beginning of the pandemic that the, the the longest term impact could be to kids who are kept out of school. Um, so that that is really good news. I, I may have missed this, but could you could you go back to the testing pilots? I am curious about where we are on the possibility of on site testing and you know test instead of quarantine types of approaches and i think you talked about it but I, I i think i missed it somehow yeah no i just touched on it we're just in the very early stages as a matter of fact meeting this week um with a few schools about this um and this is a different approach this is a much more focused approach looking at um you know, making sure that we understand um, if and where transmission is happening. Um, it's different than the voluntary testing that um, the schools are opting into. So um, many schools are opting into the statewide uh, testing uh, system, which is different than what we're talking about. This is really an effort to potentially inform public health practice, um, which again, we hope will help us clearly understand how we can modify and recommend changes both with the state and the region specifically to quarantine or adjusted activities that again, we know are higher risk, like we mentioned before. Um, if there are specific activities like lunch, sports, choir, drama, et cetera, that we can make modifications to even when somebody is exposed, that might be a route that we can go, but again, clearly has to be informed by another month of data and potentially some pilot testing. Got it. So we're we're using it as a as a research uh, tool, essentially, to to shape policy. Actually, I I would say it's not research. That's a distinction that we make pretty carefully. It's it's to inform public health practice. Um, so research would um, be a be a whole rigorous body of work that would require a IRB review. Sorry, I'm getting into geeky public health stuff here, but it, there is a distinction. This is to inform public health practice on the ground. Got it. Thank you. I'll, I'll be careful about using that word as well. Um, so, and then the voluntary program with the state, you mentioned that a lot of test schools, schools are opting into it. So there are schools in Multnomah County that are offering testing on site. Is, is that how it works? Yes, and we can provide more details to you every, um, I believe every week the state puts out a new list of what schools have engaged in um, the OHA testing program. Great. Yeah, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. Hi, and first of all, I want to apologize. My dog is in the hospital right now, and my the vet called literally, I understand at the time that questions were being asked and I was called on. So I apologize for being off for a few moments while I um, spoke with the vet. Uh, so um, I, I did have a couple of, um, a couple of questions and uh, in terms of the, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, in terms of the schools, uh, obviously a huge deal. Um, in, in terms of where we are actually citing clinics and being able to get kids in to be seen uh, or to be vaccinated in that low barrier, uh, sort of way, um, Jessica, I really appreciated your uh, information that you provided when we spoke uh, yesterday, the day before, anyway, um, some of the information that you provided offline and, uh, and know that you are in very close contact with the superintendents and doing all that work to ensure that um, we are approaching uh, pediatric vaccination very intentionally uh, looking at um, you know potential unintended consequences, all of the all of the work that's happening, and um, in terms of the citing 
you know, we were looking for sites that we could locate those clinics and just wanted to reemphasize that um, working with the schools, the kids are there, um, most of the kids anyway. And so it just seems like the ideal approach to be focusing on these trusted venues where kids already are, families know, families trust, to be able to have those be the sites and facilities where kids could could be vaccinated most uh, efficiently. And so just wanted to put that out there. I don't know if there's, I think you were meeting with them again later this week. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if, if if you were on when I was talking about the comprehensive planning, but we're part of a group that involves um, the regional uh, tri-county public health divisions, um, CBOs, um, education service districts, schools, healthcare, and CCOs. And the good news is, is that we have a little bit more breathing room to plan this time. Doesn't mean something isn't gonna go wrong. I mean, you all know COVID, everything unexpected does happen, but we're at least able to plan forward a little bit more. Um, and really engage with partners like schools and pediatric practices. We expect the pediatric community is obviously going to be a large part of this effort. Um, and we are going to focus our public health resources based on our data and community feedback to continue to establish low barrier clinics that require a different approach for kids. So the, the one thing that's a little bit different about that that I was mentioning before is that we have to look at facilities that allow us to um, take into account that when children get vaccinated, especially younger children, if you have kids crying and upset, that can affect other children that are waiting for vaccination. So we're looking at facilities and spaces with an eye towards being able to provide that um, for children. So that will include schools and other facilities. Great. Um, well, I look forward to continuing to hear more about that that process uh, and I had another question just more of a definition question and uh, I and and you may have um, referred to this as well but just you know you talked about in school notification processes and you know it talked about exposures and outbreaks and just how what how is an exposure defined? Like, what is an exposure? Is it if a kid in your classroom has it? If it's a kid at your group of tables? Like, what defines an exposure and what defines an outbreak right now? Jen, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, so, hi, Christian Myron. So, yeah, so an exposure um, is defined as at least 15 minutes within six feet. Um, it, for the most part, does not take into account outdoor versus indoor, even though we know outdoors is much, much lower risk for transmission. Um, it does not take into account masks with one exception. And the exception to that definition is in a classroom, if a supervising adult can basically attest to mask use um, and at least three feet between kids. That's the one exception um, where that, uh, that circumstance does not qualify for quarantine. Um, so it's within uh, six feet for 15 minutes. Okay. Um, and yeah, I was referring specifically to the classrooms and I, I still find it strange that there's a difference of definition in classrooms. Uh, I should have added Commissioner Myron if I could. I, yeah, thank you. So I, sh I should have said that the reason <laughs> that, that is an exception um, is actually based on data, largely from last spring from the Centers for Disease Control who looked at uh, school districts that had children return and they saw very low risk of transmission for that specific setting. Um, so that is why that is a, a carve out. Awesome. Well, there, that is, thank you, that's perfect. And, um, and then I, I too um, had some similar questions to Commissioner Jayapal around the testing and uh, in the pilots. And, you know, I, I had been uh, advocating for and focusing on sort of that on-site surveillance testing and that that could be an approach to just, I, I mean, to, lessen the need for quarantine to understand better the, the dynamics that are involved in school-based transmission, asymptomatic carriers, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, I don't feel that our statewide program is 
necessarily an effective approach, but, um, you know, and so was wondering if sort of that surveillance testing approach was going to be considered in any of our, in any of the pilots. Uh, and I, I think Jessica, you sort of responded to that question a bit. And I just wanted to, like, as those conversations are happening, I would love to continue to, um, to hear about that in some depth, because I, I, I think it's, um, it's really important as we're looking at how this, how this virus acts and particularly with kids. Yeah, that's, that's why we're trying to get creative to figure out what can we do given our staff capacity and, um, you know, lots of different barriers to overcome and be creative. So we can definitely come back and talk more about it, but that's, that's really the intent is to get a better handle on what's happening more from a public health perspective. Great. Well, um, thank you again, as always, for all of the uh, incredible work that you continue to do in your teams. Thank you. Thanks public health team. Next step. Oh, it's not a briefing day, even though we started with a briefing Marina. Excuse me. Moi. Art 2. FY 2022 supplemental budget modification number two, appropriating 59.7 million in the general fund, federal state program fund, coronavirus uh, response fund, risk fund, and facilities management fund. So moved. moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R2. Christian Elkin, budget director. Please begin. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners, Christian Elkin, Budget Director, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, today is a, an exciting day for us. It is the final step in our state and federal rebalance process. Uh, this morning, I will provide you with an overall summary of the funding changes, and then we will have guests from each department who will provide you with a high level overview of the individual department changes. Uh, two important process notes, if we can go to the next slide, please, Marina. Um, first, we have combined the 13 separate department actions into one voting item for you this morning. Uh, like we do with amendments, the board can decide to consider any of the department actions separately if needed. And second, I'd like to provide you with a reminder of why we are using a supplemental budget instead of a regular budget modification. A supplemental budget is the mechanism by which Oregon budget law allows the board to make changes to the county's adopted budget to address financial change conditions not anticipated at the time of budget adoption. Technically, as defined by Oregon budget law, all budget modifications are supplemental budgets, but the majority of the budgetary adjustments qualify for exemptions that allow the changes to be adopted by simple resolution. When those exemptions are not applicable, like in the instance we are, we are faced with today, where we are increasing funds by more than 10%, or other situations like transferring money between funds, transferring more than 15% from contingency, or establishing a new fund like you did two weeks ago with the Integrated Clinical Services Fund, a more involved public process and public notice and public hearing is required. The public notice and public hearing are required in this case because the appropriations in both the federal state program fund and the coronavirus 19 response fund are increasing by more than 10%. By approving a supplemental budget, it allows the county to maintain compliance with the Oregon budget law. Uh, this uh, action was noticed in the uh, Daily Journal of Commerce on, sorry, I had that date and now I've lost it, on October 6th. So we have met all of the requirements for the supplemental budget and um, I'm excited to bring this event to you today. So if we could go to the next slide, please. I would just like to remind the board as over the course of the last three weeks, thank you to everyone for sticking with us. We held three work sessions where departments briefed you on the details of the changes before you today. We also provided follow up on the questions that the board asked during those work sessions. Our first work session was a uh, public safety with community justice, the sheriff's office and the local public safety coordinating council. On October 5th, we held our second work session where we highlighted County Human Services, the library, the Joint Office of Homeless Services and non-departmental. And then just Tuesday, you had a work session with the health department. We can go to the next slide, please. 
This pie chart shows you the revised budget as we enter into this um, budget modification. As a reminder, you took several significant budget actions on, on September 30th, such as moving the Health Department's Integrated Clinical Services budget into a new fund, which moved $147 million out of the general fund and the Fed State Fund into that fund. And you added $19.5 million for emergency rent assistance and eviction prevention in the COVID-19 response fund. This pie chart shows the fiscal year 2022 revised budget as of September 30th, which contains over $2.8 billion. This includes our service reimbursements, our internal cash transfers and reserves. The pie slices for individual funds are primarily those impacted by the supplemental budget, primarily the state and federal fund and the COVID-19 relief fund, which account for about 20% of our total budget, as well as the new FQHC fund. The 1.3 billion in all other funds kind of lumps together the remaining funds in order to give you a picture of the entire budget. We can go to the next slide, please. Here we've provided a nice bar chart that shows you the changes from the departments that impact the funds. Of those, only two funds have significant changes that I want to highlight for you. First, you see here the federal state fund, which will significantly increase by a total of just over $33.1 million. That increase includes 2.5 million in the Department of Community Justice, 1.2 million in the Sheriff's Office, 16 million or almost half will be accounted for in the Department of County Human Services, almost $12 million in the Joint Office of Homeless Services, 1.4 million in the Health Department, and a very small change of $54,000 in non-departmental. We can go to our next slide, please. The second major impact from the supplemental budget will be in fund 1515, which we call our COVID-19 response fund. This, this fund includes the CARES funding and the American Rescue Plan funding from all sources. This action before you will increase the fund by $18.9 million through the following actions. Approximately $13.7 million will increase in the Department of County Human Services. And again, this primarily is in the low income energy and water assistance and weatherization in youth and family services. There's a $3.1 million increase in the Joint Office of Homeless Services and a $2 million increase in the Health Department. You also see two smaller increases of $14,000 in non departmental and $112,000 in the library. We can go to our next slide, please. So this quick graph here just shows you that this supplemental budget will increase our full-time equivalent employees by almost 115 FTE, which is roughly a 2% increase over the adopted budget. This increase brings our total FTE to just over 5,395 FTE. We provided you just a historical context in this graph so that you can see the changes and how they increase our FTE over the last five years. The largest increase will be in the federal state fund, which will add 88.58 FTE primarily in county human services. And then the COVID-19 response fund will increase our FTE by just under 18, over two thirds of which are, will be in the health department, which they talked about to you on Tuesday. The general fund will see a more modest increase of 8.29 FTE, mainly in county human services. We can go to our next slide, please. I wanted to provide you a quick summary of the total direct changes that we will see in the departments. This totals just under $53.4 million with DCHS or County Human Services accounting for more than 58% of the total increase. Uh, at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to the departments so they can provide you to, an overview of how these funds will impact their departments. We can go to the next slide, please. We'd like to start with our Department of Community Justice and Erica Pruitt, their director. Good morning, Erica. Good morning, Tara Kafori and Board of County Commissioners. Um, it's so great to see you. And I am accompanied today by Jay Scroggin, our Adult uh, Services Division Director. Um, and we are going to do the high level overview of our statewide rebalance. And thank you for setting the table, um, Christian. So, first of all, 
we are excited and we're energized and we're hopeful about the investments that the legislator has provided in the past session. These rebalance proposals represent an effort to begin to rebuild our capacity to serve the youth and adults on our caseloads, their families, victims, and survivors. Additionally, the rebalance allows us to make strategic investments to staffing, community investments, and programs that will enhance our ability to continue to engage in reforming our system and strengthen our ability to inclusively lead with race. I will begin with our adult services division. ASD's budget is increasing by around 2.18 million. ASD has three funding streams that impact our budget. The biggest funding impact came with our 1145 funding. During the legislative 2021-23 session, the legislator recognized the cost and investments that community corrections incurs to provide supervision, services, and sanctions. The total grant and aid budget was approved at 284 million. The specifics are forecasted caseload budget, current service level is 234.4 million for the forecasted caseload budget. An adjustment for increased salary inflation of 32.7 million. An elimination of supervision fees. Counties were provided 10 million to make up for the revenue loss from collecting these fees. An investment of 7 million for the supervision of misdemeanor domestic violence and sex crimes. Senate Bill 497. This funding is allocated based on felony population, and we currently supervise 17.7% of felony justice involved individuals. We also had an increase of about 24,000 in Measure 57 funds. Lastly, we will have some net reductions based on Criminal Justice Commission specialty court grants. These reductions needed to be made to match the adopted budget in our grant award. While we did experience some reductions in our specialty court funding, Multnomah County was awarded a new CJC grant for the Strategic Treatment and Engagement Program, the STEP program. STEP will provide wraparound services for ballot measure 11 downward dispositional departure where there are disparate numbers of African American men and they're, they're, they're overrepresented. Total amount was granted um, that was granted to Multnomah County was roughly 1.1 million for the biennium. The funding went to the circuit court, public defenders, providers, and DCJ. We will receive a little over 398,000 for supplies and services. In total, this funding will restore 11 FTE reductions taken during the last two biennium. This includes adding two POs to lower caseload sizes in our domestic violence unit and adding one PO and a corrections technician to specifically work with justice involved individuals of color. Increased treatment services for alcohol and drug outpatient and out and residential services for justice involved individuals not covered by the Oregon Health Plan. Funding for culturally specific mentors to serve our BIPOC populations. And it also adds case management services and uh, the treatment readiness storm. Slide two, please. DCJ's adopted budget assumed reductions to funding we received from the Oregon Youth Authority. Ultimately, the state's budget adopted, adopted budget maintained these funds at current service level. This results in an increase of 361,000 for juvenile services division. The slide shows the specific amounts. JSD used county general fund to offset the reductions we anticipated to programs funded with JCP basic and diversion and GTS dollars, necessitating cuts to other positions. With full state funding approved, the county general fund is once again freed up to, to provide other services. In the end, this restoration will allow us to do the following. Restore a program specialist senior, who will coordinate the implementation of our transforming juvenile probation initiative, including the development and oversight of a youth advisory council. Funds a new records technician position to support the increased workload resulting from new legislation on automatic expansion of juvenile records. Provides enhancement to an outdoor recreation area in detention. Provides 50,000 to fund community-based programming in detention and also to provide direct client assistance for justice-involved youth and families. 
that is the end of our presentation and um, I would be happy to take questions when I'm ready. Thanks, Erica. We're going to move through um, all the slides we've since this is these are all things that we've heard before. But if folks have questions that are burning questions, just um, speak out, send me a text. We'll um, we'll move. Otherwise, we'll just move through and then have questions at the end. Sheriff Reese looks like you. It is and good morning, Chair Kafori and uh, Board of County Commissioners. I'm Multnomah County Sheriff Mike Reese, and I'm pleased to be here today to present to the Board of County Commissioners a budget modification acknowledging and allocating $1,234,734 in uh, state Senate Bill 145 funds that will restore program offer 60330F. This program offer uh, basically funds uh, a dorm at Inverness Jail that requires five 0.46 FTE corrections deputies and two corrections counselors. And I'm really pleased with this outcome, given the complexity of managing a corrections setting during a pandemic. Although the state's funding was initially reduced, we continue to carry these costs as we maintain the open dorm in order to support lower populations and social distancing as recommended by our partners in the health department and uh, corrections health. And I appreciate the board's partnership as we restore Senate Bill 145 funds. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Sheriff. Uh, good morning, Chair and uh, County Commissioners. My name is uh, David. I'm the um, Department Director of County Human Services. And uh, I have also the full team with me here in case if there are any questions. Uh, with that, I believe we have given you a briefing before, so this will be like a pretty fast. As you noted, um, DCHS actually has the lion's share of the uh, budget rebalance, uh, all in all around $30 million. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about in which division are those, but generally speaking, uh, those uh, positions that we are proposing to uh, fund um, uh, are mostly in case management. Uh, as you have heard uh, prior that we are trying to balance the workload. Uh, we're fortunate that the state given, gave us that infusion of funds to uh, mitigate and deal with the increase in workload in aging and disability services and developmental disabilities division. So you'll see we are getting about $8.9 million in, uh, for aging and disability services. Medicaid funding, about 2.2 million in Older American Act, and 249,000 increase in other state funds. That uh, accounts for a total of 63.65 FTEs uh, and an $11.4 million for aging and disability services. Uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities, you heard a lot about the CDD uh, P workload model, the Community Developmental Disabilities Program. It uh, was typically underfunded, and uh, this will help us catch up. Uh, we'll get 34 FTE. It will help us, again, reduce the workload and build some infrastructure with protective services, um, and both also in aging services, too. Some of that will go into protective services to deal with the increased workload of the uh, program called PAM, Centralized Abuse um, uh, Management System. And um, with youth and family services, there's an increase of $11.7 million of seven FTE. Um, uh, some of that money, about 9 million uh, for low income home energy assistance program and uh, low income home water program, about 2.8 million and uh, about $100,000 from the National Association of Counties Research Foundation. And uh, we are seeing a decrease of 268. 1,660 in energy housing assistance. This is due to rebalance that we're doing because we did that money on a biennium. Lastly, uh, we have about $1. Uh, million in administration. This is to build the infrastructure that's associated with all of the increase on, of those funds to help build our business services, um, provide research and uh, 
uh, get us really uh, positioned to better support the department as a whole. And uh, with that, that's the end uh, for us. If there is questions, uh, the full team is here with me. Um, and uh, I believe we furnished all these positions. If you want to know which position, what program offers, uh, we have that available for you. Thanks, Mohammed. Library. Good morning, Chair and Board. My name is Don Allgaier, Director of Operations for the Multnomah County Library. You have before you a budget modification that allows the library to take advantage of $112,800 in Institute of Museum and Library Services Recovery Act funds to strengthen our effort to decrease the digital divide. It, that effort will include both a vehicle and staffing outreach for our program. Chromebooks to provide technical support in communities that need it most. Uh, while this is Don, not a, a, Don, uh, Don, huge amount of money. Uh, Don Algaier, really good for us. We'll be building upon things that we've already seen within the library. Glad to answer. Don, your um, internet is extremely unstable. Wondering if you could turn off your um, camera and see if that helps a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Would you mind um, start? Yeah, maybe turn your camera off and then go back about halfway through your talk. We we lost you. Yeah, sorry about that. The um, so the library um, will receive one hundred and twelve thousand eight hundred dollars in Institute of Museum and Library Services uh, Recovery Act funds, and those funds will be used to strengthen our to decrease the digital divide in our community by increasing uh, extra hours staffing and vehicle support for our digital equity work, providing Chromebooks more computer labs and tech most around questions that you might have. Thanks, Don. Adam Brown. Good morning, Chair Kaforian, Commissioners. Adam Brown here from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. I use he, him, his pronouns. So the rebalance for the joint office results in a total budget increase of $14.9 million. As Mark described to you at last week's work session, our rebalance uh, changes fall into three high level categories. Those related to COVID-19 funding, additional funding we've received for shelter strategic investments in our emergency shelter system, and the other state and federal rebalancing, which really is the exercise we do each and every year to true up the budget based on actual award amounts and carryover balances. So for the COVID-19 changes, we're adding 1 million of carryover CARES Act resources to support our ongoing COVID-19 programming from July to December. We're adding 5.1 million of American Rescue Plan Act funding from the city of Portland to fund the ongoing operations of those same activities through the end of the fiscal year. This is a match of an allocation of the same amount made by the county that was included in our adopted budget. And we're making a neutral change on the funding to support our outdoor shelter sites, which swaps $3 million of city ARP funding for city general funds. With regard to the shelter capital changes, we're adding $5 million that was allocated by the state to fund the renovation of the Arbor Lodge shelter. And we're adding 3.5 million dollars of funding allocated through the state's project turnkey program for the acquisition of a moto shelter in gresham that's currently being used as part of our COVID 19 programming and then uh, lastly for the other state and federal rebalancing we're making what amounts to relatively modest changes across eight different funding sources to true up the budget based on carryover balances and actual award amounts resulting in a net funding increase of just under three hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's all I have for the joint office. 
Thanks, Anna Brown. Ebony. Sadly, it's me instead. Um, good morning, Wendy. Chair and <laughs> good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm uh, Wendy Lear, Deputy Director for the Health Department, and I'm going to turn my camera off because I don't want to follow Don and Jessica's fate of having poor internet connection. So, um, so thank you. This morning, um, we are here to um, review changes in the Public Health Division and in the Behavioral Health Division. Uh, which you heard about on Tuesday. So, starting in the public health division, we have an increase of 2.4 million dollars and an increase in 13.87 FTE. Most of this funding is coming through um, COVID response uh, funding streams. We have uh, just over 600,000 dollars in reach grant funding uh, to support our uh, COVID-19. Um, activities supporting the African American community. We have $371,000 in ELC funding, um, which is funding for the immunization um, program. And we've also reorganized uh, the use of $1.4 million in CARES Act funding to support the addition of uh, 11 uh, FTE in that area and to rebuild our vaccine program. And then uh, finally, in the CARES Act funding for public health, we're recognizing a million in ELC funding, um, which will support our uh, vaccine incentive efforts and keep those uh, uh, incentive programs going through the middle of November. And so um, then we have some small changes in the federal and state fund in public health. Um, we have an increase of one and a half FTE in the WIC program and $155,000 of additional WIC funding because the program has um, seen an increase in the number of clients they're serving. And then a small increase um, uh, for the syringe program and um, some public health modernization funding that is adding uh, just under one FTE uh, to support uh, the administration of culturally um, community based organizations and staff in the uh, health promotion and prevention program. And finally, there's a small increase in general fund through fees for the vector program and those fees are paid to us by the city of Portland. Uh, next slide. Um, the additional increases in the behavioral health division are 1.1 million dollars and one FTE. And uh, unlike public health, most of this is through their regular um, state contract um, for behavioral health services. So there's a net zero, like a net uh, uh, no impact change in their COVID-19 response uh, program offer that is county um, ARPA funding. And that is adding a, an FTE and reallocating some of the uh, funding that was going for grants um, and other services. And then in the federal and state program, um, there is a uh, $854,533 increase in their state uh, uh, federal assistance award or state funding award. And that includes $689,000 for substance abuse uh, rate increases for providers. So that's Pass through dollars from the county and increase a small increase to the aid and assist program and a uh, $34,000 increase in housing coordination funding. And um, there's uh, an additional recognition of some beginning working capital that was inadvertently um, left off of the adopted budget um, this spring. And so they're recognizing. Uh, that beginning working capital that funds a state mental health grant contract uh, for behavioral health services for kids. And then finally, the Reynolds School District is um, paying us $37,000 for student based mental health services that have been uh, provided to Reynolds School District for some time. Um, they're just now uh, funding those, those services. And that is all for the health department. Thank you, Wendy. 
uh, Christian Elkin, um, budget analyst for non-departmental. Just a quick reminder that we have dual three small hats. changes. Christian dual hats. Um, my favorite department, non-departmental. Uh, so we have three small changes. The local, local public safety coordinating council is also receiving an increase in their Senate Bill 1145 funding that will uh, net, it will be a net gain of about $55,000. And this is going to continue to support the work that they're doing amount, around reimagine uh, safety. Uh, we're also appropriating just under $14,000 of the uh, business, uh, small business relief cares act funding. That was uh, a balance that was available when we ended fiscal year 2021. This funding will be allocated to the micro enterprise services of Oregon, also known as MISO, um, which will be uh, allocating that for some debt business forgiveness uh, program. And then finally, we are increasing the tax supervising and conservation commission appropriation by just under $23,000. This is the maximum allowed for their appropriation level under the Oregon legislation that authorizes the TSCC. With that, uh, I'd like to move to our next slide. And it is questions time. So thank you very much. I know this is a lot, um, but hopefully you've had over the course of the last three weeks to really engage with this process and get the information that you need. And I'm just so excited that we are increasing our budget. Uh, I can't remember the last time we did a state and federal rebalance where we were significantly increasing our budget. So this is a very exciting time to be the budget director. Thank you. I thought you were going to say it's because you're the budget director. This is what happens when Christian Elkin is your budget director. All right, commissioners, uh, questions or comments? Um, and I think everyone's still on the phone, so um, there's plenty of people to answer any questions you might have. Start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you, um, everyone who presented here today and for all this ongoing work and for the briefings where uh, you presented all the information in in depth and for answering some of the supplemental questions. And particularly, thank you, Christian, for putting it all together in, uh, in such an effective way. Um, really appreciate all of that uh, incredible work. I, I had a couple of follow up questions that uh, follow up from our prior follow up questions. We had some written responses and, uh, and so I just wanted to uh, raise those and um, most of them do go to measurement and impact, like how we are measuring the outcomes and that we want to see and uh, in the impact of these additional dollars. So the first, and I'll, I'll just go in, in the order um, that I think these were presented, but uh, for DCHS um, had wanted to find out more information sort of about the universe of energy and weatherization. And I think there was information provided on the weatherization, I mean, on the, the low income energy uh, work and also water. And I, I'm not sure, and I may have just missed it. So my apologies if so, but, um, on the weatherization aspect of of where this funding is going. Uh, this is Mohammed. Uh, I have Peggy Sam on. If you'd like, uh, Chair and Commissioner, I can have her uh, type in. Please do. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, this is Peggy Sam, also known as Peggy Samolinsky. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm happy to be here today. Um, and I'm the director of the Youth and Family Services Division. Um, Commissioner Ry Myron, um, we did include in that, um, in the responses to the questions, information about weatherization. I think the questions were specific to how are we connecting with communities and how do we know the need in the community for these particular services? We actually did not address that about water because we don't have that information right now. But um, I can review with you if you'd like uh, the information that we did provide and we're happy to do more or provide another briefing about this if you'd like. 
I'm looking so, at it now. So okay, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. So it's it's um, and I don't you know we, I don't know how you want to do this. It's it's on page two and three, two uh, four, page four and page four, the bottom of page four of the responses that Christian yeah. sent to everybody. Maybe it was that I saw low income energy and water on the slide presented today, and I, this might okay. just be a technical thing, and so I'm happy to look at that later. Okay, um, but. Uh, I think hopefully that should be answered then. I think it was putting those together. Fair enough. Thank um, you. But just let us know, please. Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, the second question how to, had to do with, and um, and I don't know if uh, Commissioner Jayapal's question had been answered in, in the written answers to our question. I did have a question based on her question and the answers, if that even makes any sense anymore. But uh, there was a question raised about sort of shifts in workload and what, how that would impact services and client outcomes. And I think that there was, um, you know, a reference to the types of things that should be improved, which is great. And I just wanted to understand how we're actually measuring that improvement so that we um, so that we are quantifying. I know this is uh, by its nature fairly subjective, uh, but how we are quantifying to the extent that we can those things like increased consumer satisfaction, increased trust in services, better person centered service plans and those kinds of things. Uh, this is Mohammed again, and if you're uh, still on, on DCHS, um, I'm happy to provide you with more data. Uh, since a lot of these are Medicaid programs, usually there are timelines uh, that we have to meet. Uh, for example, finishing an intake in 45 days, or also finishing an investigation in a certain period of time, completing reports. So. They come actually with uh, standards, and uh, this will help us actually meet those standards. Uh, but I know in addition to that, we have done some customer satisfaction surveys um, in the past, and so uh, we're happy to replicate those in the future. Uh, we've done those both with the, the uh, either with the consumers or partners, um, and uh, we certainly can uh, add that. And uh, like uh, I think uh, Lee mentioned, uh, last presentation that uh, we have like robust uh, researchers with each division and uh, we are happy to bring in all those outcome measures. Um, the department has a performance management council and a lot of times we have gone uh, over every program offer and have looked at uh, from the nitty gritty action steps to the 10,000 foot uh, from a population, uh, pay, uh, you know, from like how the impact to the population in general to how we do like step by step. So we're happy to furnish that to you and happy to have like a kind of a more of a smaller kind of a team meet with you on that and explain that. I would love that um, and really appreciate that Mohammed. That is a that that is um, a great response. And so I will look forward to that. Thank you. Um, we'll look um, for like if you have a feedback for us of how to formulate and how to look at the outcomes, we'd be happy to do that. Wonderful. And uh, Commissioner Meyer, yeah, as these new um, new hires haven't started yet. We're ha um, you know these now we're allocating the dollars that people will be able to um, add positions. We can have them come back later after people have the programs have been up and running and people have been at work and have a um, com follow up conversation about how um, to answer some of the questions. That would be that would be fantastic. Uh, thank you. And then um, next, I had a question on. Uh, I think my final one was on. Um, oh, actually, I had two more, but one on the joint office. And I think one of the questions again that I had raised that was responded to, I think in part in the uh, written response was the funding break was 
was about uh, shelter capacity and what impact we we will see on um, you know on the streets and in a decrease in sort of that unsheltered houselessness. And uh, I, there was a, a lot of information provided about the um, many millions of dollars that we're spending on that, but there was not information provided about the second aspect of the question, which was um, how this will change the scenario and impact on people living outside on the streets. And so I don't know if there's a response to that specific aspect of the question, and I'm happy to talk about that offline as well. Sorry, my voice is breaking and I have no idea why. <laughs> yeah, Commissioner Adam Brown here. Thanks so much for your question. So I, I do think it would be best if we followed up after. Um, you know, the the actions we are taking as part of the budget rebalance really are are sort of the technical actions we need to take for um, fully funding the programming that we had already presumed in the budget. It continues our ongoing funding, our ongoing COVID response. You know, we're working in partnership with the city on the Safe Rest Village project and and that, you know, the development of that programming is underway. So I think we wanted to get part of the way in answering your question uh, as far as we could in a week. We have more in-depth uh, data on our FY21 outcomes related to our, our core programming. But uh, to be more specific, perhaps it would be best to connect one-on-one uh, -on -one and get a better sense of what it is you're looking for. And we can, by all means, follow up as needed. Thanks so much, Adam. That would be, that would be great. And and as part of that, um, just I you know I know we are using some of the supportive housing services measure money in that is part of this uh, this additional um, structure. And so would also love to um, talk about how that's being accounted for, like the crossover in accountability for supportive housing services measure funding in addition to how it is um, uh, increasing our budget as a whole and going toward toward this work. Yeah, absolutely. And we can we can talk more about that as well. But I think in in short, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit um, over the last you know, six to nine months with regard to the opportunities we've had to leverage one time federal dollars to permanently expand our system. Right? So we're kind of in a unique situation where we've been able to leverage those federal dollars to act, acquire like the Arbor Lodge shelter, right. a couple of motels, and then the Metro measure provides us the ongoing funding that we need to permanently incorporate those sites into our system. Right? And so that's really in short the bridge um, it, because not every jurisdiction has that uh, it is, is that fortunately situated, right, to have a new source of ongoing funding to run those sites. So um, that's an important connection for us, and we can we can talk more about that as needed. I would love that. And I just want to, um, well, Adam, I appreciate that you will follow up with Commissioner Meyer to, to better understand what questions she has. This is a topic that is um, of interest to all the members of the board, so we will work to have a, um, a board briefing in the near future to talk about this topic and others, but I, you know, getting the, the specific question that commissioner Myron needs answered is, is fine. But we, I do know that all the commissioners would have interest in this. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you chair and thank you, Adam. And then I, I just had my 1 finish on a high note, but the question just about vector enforcement and I know that's a. Really, you know, in the big scheme of this, this is a drop in the bucket in in all of this funding allocation. But would love to have I. One of the things I've been hearing about most um, is. Rats on our streets and and things like that. And so this does seem very relevant to the times and things that are happening right now. And so. Would love to have again, maybe with the health department, some further conversations about. You know, investments in vector control and how that works from our. Uh, our public health standpoint. Yeah, and there, there's a meeting today on that topic as um, it, it is uh, 
been brought to our attention numerous times. So um, while I don't think we have the exact answer that you might want at this point, and is this a high note question? Because I'm thinking rats running around the streets of our yes, city. Yes. It's actually a low note. But um, we'll get back to you with, with um, what we're thinking as soon as we have our plan. Thank you. That is perfect. And um, I think I was sarcastically referring it to being a, a high note. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, those are all my questions. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess I'll start with the high note that Commissioner Myron ended on, which is to say that I went out with um, Terrence Moses, who lives in North Portland and does trash pickup uh, six days a week, and saw firsthand the vector problem. So. Again, while it seems like a detail, um, you know, uh, in terms of what's actually happening out there, it's it's really important. So I appreciate it seeing seeing that we've got some more resource to put to that. Um, There's got to be a pun there, right? With tail <laughs> detail, I, I'm not. <laughs> I think there might be. Um, yeah, it was unintentional. Um, um, uh, to, to follow up on the outcomes. Oh, uh, thank you, everybody. I should have started there. Thank you for all of the work that's gone into figuring out how to put these additional resources to good use. It is really exciting um, to, to see that we have those additional resources and that some holes have been filled. And, you know, the, the piece around caseload and getting those caseloads closer to where they need to be through the state formulas. Um, I think that's that's a that has been a huge structural problem, and so it is great to see that being addressed. Um, I have really appreciated all of the briefings, and um, Christian, you know, always appreciate how thoughtfully you all put it together so that um, it is it is easier to understand and conceptually easier to understand in addition to the numbers. So thank you very much for all of that. Also appreciated the follow up on the outcomes. I think, you know. That's a broader conversation. I mean, we I asked about outcomes and how those would be affected by these additional resources. But I think what I continue to to work on understanding is the ultimate metrics and outcomes that you are all, um, you know, holding us accountable to in all of the spending that we do. So just a comment to say that I know that every year the the budget process during the budget process, um, we work on showing that information in new and better ways. And I, I think that that's, that's kind of what my question was going to and uh, appreciate the effort to continue to, to really hone down on not just how many people are we serving, but then what are the metrics for how we're serving better and making, making long lasting change. Um, and, and on joint office, uh, Chair, I appreciated you were mentioning that we're having a briefing because I, yes, we are all interested. I, I think, um, that again, that's the bigger picture. This is a rebalance, but that gets to the bigger question, bigger, bigger picture questions. Adam, I did appreciate your uh, explanation of how the one time investment then connects with the ongoing support. I think that's that is an important piece of how these funds are working together. So I really appreciated that. That's it. No, no additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks everyone for the presentation today and all of the briefings. They were really helpful as we're talking about like these really good and significant amounts of money that are um, that we're being able to add into our budget in so many different ways. And um, Christian, thanks so much for all your help in organizing and coordinating um, the presentations and the work. Um, it, it's It's been really helpful to see. Um, I also like really appreciate the the big investment that we're seeing at DCHS that, you know, I think those dollars are really going to make a significant difference in how we're able to serve our clients and how in the and the care um, that we're going to have for folks, you know, through our services that are that are really getting those caseloads um, into the recommended, you know, and optimal sizes. And I think that's going to turn out to see those outcomes. So, um, so having the conversations about what that looks like, you know, in action is really good. Um, I also appreciate, you know, the um, the DCJ investments, even though we're not back to where we were beforehand, this actually, you know, does go some distance in, in making up the cuts that have been so hard to do over the last few years um, for the services for youth and adults. And so that's really positive to see. Um, 
and then for the joint office, right? Like these are these are wonderful investments that we're able to make. And Adam, I appreciate your connecting these one-time investments with how we're going to be able to like continue continue to do these because of the support of housing services measure. I did have a question about the joint office piece. Um, it didn't seem like there were any FTE increases that are a result of these additional dollars. Is that correct, or, or are there also FTE increases because of these investments? So there's a little nuance to that question. So you know, Commissioner, that um, in, in normal times, 90% of the joint office's funding is pushed out through contracted services, right? So we don't we don't do direct service delivery. We rely on our um, extensive network of committed partner organizations to do this really important work. Uh, with COVID, we have done some direct service delivery. So we're currently operating two shelters and we have uh, temporary and limited duration staff that are running those shelters. So uh, these resources do cover personnel costs, but not by way of permanent FTE. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. It was just, we did see some of the FTE on all the other ones, but not for this one. So these are gonna be more the contracted positions with our service providers. Okay, um, those are my questions. Thanks so much. And um, again, I'm looking forward to the broader um, overview and briefing on the Jordan Office's work um, as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, just wanna reiterate uh, Kristen's earlier comments that this is all very good news. Usually we're, uh, cutting or doing something that, that is less desirable. So adding important programming, staff, um, services for our community is, is good news today. And so I just wanna thank all of you. I know it's been a lot of work um, figuring out the different machinations here. Um, so I appreciate all of you and all the time that you've spent answering all of our questions. Um, Marina, did we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair. All right. Um, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The supplemental budget modification is approved. Thank you very much, everybody. Yay. Moving on to the next thing. That is it for our agenda items. Uh, we do have time now for any non-agenda items. Um, Commissioner Vega Peterson, do you have anything for us this morning? I do not have anything this morning. Just wishing everybody a good week. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of events to mention. Um, Raphael House is having its gala this evening. And then in uh, District 2, a couple of events, the MLK Dream Run is happening, and I'm uh, co-sponsoring that with Reach. And then uh, finally, on Sunday, uh, there's a community event in Cully from 1 to 4 p.m. at K Park. And this is the outgrowth of the work that my office has been doing with organizations in the Cully neighborhood about public safety and about things that they'd like to see happen, community-oriented approaches to increasing safety. Um, so, several of our partners in Cully, including Hacienda, Verde, Living Cully, Habitat, as well as the Health Department and our DCHS have been collaborating on creating this event. So, one to four at Cape Park um, would love to have folks turn out. Thanks. Thank you. And Commissioner Myron. Wait, 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 wait. Pause. Erica Pruitt, who do you have there? My grandson, Bodie. Oh, <laughs> Bodie, and how old is Bodie? Bodie is six weeks. <gasps> oh. <laughs> okay, now you're just making us all really jealous. Okay. Thank you so much. For, <laughs> thank you for allowing us a, a viewing of that sweet, sweet baby. And congratulations, Grandma. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Myron. Try to beat that. Yeah, right. What do I even say? That was so beautiful. That's a perfect note to end on. I do not have anything. I also understand Erica is getting a um, a new four legged friend today as well. So she's reaping all of the goodness and all of the benefits today and deserving all of the love. So thanks, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and don't forget to get your flu shot. <laughs>